Susan Elliott, travel writer extraordinaire. Welcome again to Food, Wine, Pets, Travel. Thank you very much for having me again, Kay and Brian. Well, uh, you're more than welcome. And I tell you what, you pointed out the other day, we've known each other for an awfully, awfully long time, but I didn't know you'd actually been to AA. Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, it's, What's AA? Um, What's AA? AA is the best AA you'll ever go to. <laughs> <laughs> The Aurora Australis, also known as the Southern Lights. So the southern cousin of AB, Aurora Borealis. (laughs) Well, that sounds really boring, the Aurora Borealis, but I don't know about you, but I grew up in New Zealand. Well, I do know you grew up in New Zealand as well, but um, my dad used to sing the Northern Lights of Old Aberdeen because his mother did that and they're all used to the Northern Lights and they get all the glory. But for once... There's some spectacular sights being seen by Aussies down south. Tell us about it. Well, I guess with the the boring Borealis, they are very easy to see from land, from Norway, Sweden, Finland, you know, Canada. There's a lot of land mass up there to sit on a cold, craggy rock and watch the lights. But obviously down in the Antarctic rural zone, our southern lights, there's nowhere to sit unless you want to be floating in the Southern Ocean. So (laughs) the only way to see them is by air. So a company came up with the very first flight down there to see the Aurora Australis by air, and that's what I did. Well, if people are watching this video, we're looking at some of the shots now. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, this is obviously the first time you've seen it and all these other people have seen it. What was your first reaction? Um, It's quite a special sight. When you first see them, they look like swirling grey-white clouds, but they have structure and they have shape and they have patterns. And then the longer you look at them, the more the colours emerge. But a lot of the images you see of the auroras are time-lapse videos where they appear to dance in the sky. They don't dance in the sky. They are very, very slow-moving and the colours do take a while to emerge. But, yes, it's a very special sight. It's extraordinary. I can't believe the wonderful photos you've taken. And I know you're a great photographer and you've been doing this for a long time. I couldn't believe the colour and the shape. I know that our listeners heard you talking about the outback by air. Now you've gone to outer space almost to capture these amazing green, I don't know what, beautiful. Well, it really is special. You fly out of the capital cities in Australia to about 55 degrees south. So you're just on the edge of the Antarctic. But that takes you away from light pollution. You go on a moon-free night. So it's as dark and as clear as it can possibly be. And the other amazing thing about the flight is that you actually chase the auroras. If you're sitting on a rock on land, you can't do that. But in the aircraft, There's no fixed fight flight plan. We just zigzagged across the Southern Ocean to chase the lights. As they appear, we chase them. And they they actually disappear quite quickly as well. And as soon as one disappears, you chase another one. So that's a really unique thing about these flights as well. The other thing that's really unique is that the captain puts the aircraft into what's called stealth mode. So they turn on. (laughs) They turn off all of the cabin lights and in a really unusual move, they turn off all the external navigation flights in the aircraft so you're totally dark. Wow. That allows your eyes to adjust for the best views and the best photos. Yeah, that's quite amazing. I mean, um, you call it, the captain calls it stealth mode. I'd call it sort of romantic mode almost. What do you reckon? (laughs) Well, I don't know that you were there with your husband this time, Sue, but we (laughs) have a photo of you sitting in the pointy end. So the people that were on this amazing flight weren't doing it too tough, even though you had to wear masks in between champers and meals. Um, Tell oh, yes. a little bit about how special this whole flight was. Well, even if you're not up the pointy end, it doesn't really matter which seat you have because halfway through the flight, there's a seat swap so that everyone has a chance to be near a window. And that's a lovely thing too. You're not going to miss out. Uh, you can move around the aircraft quite freely as well. 
which is nice because there are a lot of windows near galleys and near the toilets and all the rest of it where you can stick your head out and your camera and get some photos. So it's, yeah, it is a unique flight in that regard. I'm going to ask you a technical question here because I know you've got sort of this science background. Um, <laughs> how how are the uh, the AAs, um, <laughs> how formed. are they formed? Well, the auroras occur when solar winds are funneled through gaps in the Earth's magnetic shield, and those gaps are at the north and south poles. So as those charged winds hit the Earth's atmosphere, the atoms become massive, you no know, dancing neon lights but we have this magnetic shield and i've renamed it a magnetic sieve because if it's got holes in it it's not much of a shield is it (laughs) (laughs) well i'm relieved to know that those particles weren't you know pushing holes in it and making us all fear conspiracy theories you know oh my god we're all gonna die that the holes are already there so these these little particles from the sun energy particles come through and then the solar winds hit it is that right and and they make these amazing things how how big are they? How, what's the perspective mm. when you're looking well, out the window? They appear massive outside your window. And we were flying at 30,000 feet, so you're well above the clouds. And the auroras were about 100 kilometres above. Wow. So that, doesn't, that sounds a long way, but it's not actually. Um, they're very close. And I can't, I wouldn't know how big they are in terms of dimension, but they're huge. How long does it last? Is it is it there all the time, or do you have to sort of chase it, or what's the what's the story? There? No, they cu- they come and go because it is solar wind. It can come, it can go, and we've got an astrophysicist on board who wanders around the aircraft to explain to passengers what the aurora is and what they're looking at. There's astrophotographers on board who wander around and help passengers take photos. And there's commentary over the PA as you go through it. We were told on our flight that auroras are measured on a scale of zero to nine. Ours was a one. So can you imagine what a nine would look like? Wow. Holy Julie. Well, I thought that was pretty damn impressive. I, I would have given a much higher score than that. So the auroras weren't around for a while, I believe, but now they're back. They have some sort of cycle. The best time to see them is over the autumn and winter months. So that's when the flights from Australia leave, just in those winter months. And the dates have all been chosen for, you know, moonless nights for the best possible viewing. Mm. And so it's not just you went from Sydney, but people can get these flights from anywhere around Australia. So give the plug. Go on. Tell us the the company well, that's doing this. I would love to. I would love to. It's a company called Chimu Adventures who are South American polar expedition specialists. Mm. That was until last year when, of course, Ah. none of their regular tours could happen. It's an Australian company. They've been around for about 15 years. So this is their COVID baby, and they came up with the idea of going down to the polar regions, which is what they specialise in, to see these lights, and they realised that the only way to do that was by air. So the first flight was the one I was on, but they're now going from Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane and Hobart, well, about six more dates this year after Mm. our chat now, and next year in 2022, they're going to be doing another round of flights. But once again, just in those autumn and winter months. Fantastic. Now, we'll we'll obviously put links on our website and and whatever, but what's the sort of the the scope of what you do and how long you you do it for? Is there some kind of package that you can get? Is it, you know, how long is it? All that sort of thing? Look, the flight is 10 hours and you leave from most of the major airports, it's about three hours to get to the Antarctic auroral zone. And then you're over in the zone for maybe three and a half to four hours and then a couple of hours back. So you can leave at eight o'clock at night. You'd have full international um, service. You're on a Qantas Dreamliner. You know, you've got all the service, drinks and food, and it's lovely. Which you really hate, yeah? You're not interested. I hate it at all. (laughs) Tricky with a mask, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And then you see the the Aurora Australis, and it's about about three hours back to mainland Australia. So it's a 10-hour round trip. And, of course, it depends on where in the aircraft you sit, but... Honestly, there's not a bad seat because of that seat rotation system. Mm. There's not a bad seat. 
Well, let's leave our listeners with a, a, a last thought. What is your overriding feeling having done this trip? I mean, what is it that is just going to stay with you forever? Transformative is a big word, but, you know, it's really, it is one of those amazing phenomena. Once in a lifetime, yeah? Yes, these it's the world's most elusive light show. Mm. You know, up until now, the only thing to have seen the Aurora Australis largely like this has been a whole bunch of disinterested Antarctic penguins. Turn the lights off. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go register that name, the world's most elusive light show. That's mm. great. It is indeed, because it is I think there's like six flights per season. It's exclusive, elusive, and it's magical, as you said. I just think it's just wonderful to see. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for telling us about it. And just to whet our listeners' appetites, um, where might you be off to next that you can tell us about in the future? <laughs> you asked me this last time, and I said the Antarctic, which I've just done now. <laughs> um, I am off next week to possibly one of my most favourite places on planet Earth, and that is Norfolk Island. I wow. just love it. Overseas trip. It's overseas without leaving Australia. Excellent. So no quarantine. Excellent. Mm-hmm. I'm there for the whole week, and it is an, an international flight, so you get your duty-free. And <laughs> I've got duty-free stores on the island, so it really is like going over on an international holiday. It's so fun. This will be my eighth trip to the island, so... I know Fantastic. it very well. Oh, you know the place very well. Obviously, with all those duty frees, your husband will be welcoming you home with open arms. I'm sure Matt will be very excited. He and- loves perfume. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure he's very happy to see her go off and do these trips. Oh, no. Huh? no. <laughs> we we should point out to listeners, Matt and Sue are our longtime friends from, I don't know, 30 plus years, something like that. Yeah. We all met. Well, I've just turned 40, so... <laughs> Thank you, Sue. And I, you know, I'm going to put that on my bucket list. Chimu flight. Oh, absolutely. And if you're traveling around Australia, which is wonderful, as you saw with my Outback by Air journey, it's great to have just a little, I'm calling it a day trip at night time. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, you can stop, stop on your journey around Australia and have a day trip at night time oh. to see this incredible sight. Fantastic. Give you something to talk about at Happy Hour. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Susan Elliott, travel writer extraordinaire and food, wine, pets travel expert.